Anyway, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis 23. We continue our study through the book of Genesis in Genesis 23 and 24 with the message entitled, A Bride for Isaac. Last time, one of my favorite and one of the most profound chapters in all of the book of Genesis And that's saying something when you have creation and the fall and the flood and the Tower of Babel. But we had Isaac born miraculously to a dad who was 100 and a mom who was 90. And and that was the prior week. And then last week in Genesis 22, Abe was instructed to take a three-day journey with Isaac and to sacrifice him on the mount God said he would show him. Turns out to be the same mountain where Solomon will build the temple, the same mountain where another father will offer his son whom he loves and uh, for the sin of all mankind. So Isaac was almost sacrificed, but it was only a test. And Abe passed this one with flying colors, and and, uh, a ram was sacrificed in the place of Isaac, but the, the prophecy had been from the lips of Abraham, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And of course, we find that lamb, not until the New Testament, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, there's something else here, and, and, and you wouldn't notice it. Well, you might, but it, it, it's not so obvious, and, and that is at before they ascended the mountain, Isaac had asked, hey, we have the wood and we have the fire. Where the, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? I already mentioned it. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. But he had told the servants to, to stay put, a couple servants traveling with him. He said, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will return to you. They were words of faith. He fully believed, the New Testament tells us, That God would just raise Isaac from the dead if he required him, if he took his life at God's command, God would have to raise him from the dead because he'd already said all the promises that I've made to you, Abe, they're going to pass to and through Isaac. So, So Abe says, we'll be back. But at the end of the story, Abraham comes back down and he meets with the other two and they head back home. Isaac isn't mentioned again, nor is he seen again, till we get to um, chapter 24. Now, he may be mentioned, but he won't be seen. And so uh, it, it's a powerful picture, and, and I'll try to connect the dots for you. If they're not already connecting, that is, our Lord, like Isaac, ascended that same mountain, only he actually gave his life. He laid down his life on Calvary's cross. That was his altar. He died for our sins, was buried and rose again. He ascended 40 days later into heaven where he has been ever since, where right now he's making intercession for us. He's praying for you, for for our families, for our fellowship, for for our our crazy state and community and, and country and world. He's praying, you see, and and, and here's the thing. We don't see Jesus again until we see him there at his very throne. So so there's a beautiful connecting point, and uh, anyway, we'll come back to it. Genesis 5 tells us that Adam had lived 930 years, and he died, and in that chapter, it lists all who had lived, you know, those who were important to God's portion of the story, that this one lived this long and he died, and this one lived this long and he died. The only exception was a guy named Enoch who never died. God took him because he loved him and because he walked with him, and Enoch walked with God and God took him. And so uh, in any case, Sarah lived 127 years. Chapter 23, verse 1, these were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abe came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Like all who went before her and all who follow after her, 
Everyone lives and dies except for Enoch, except for Elijah who was taken up alive in a pillar of fire. There are a few exceptions to the rule, except for those who will be alive at the coming of the Lord when he blows the trumpet. He doesn't return to earth. We meet him in the clouds. We see him. We worship him. And thus we will forever be with our Lord. Well, Abe stood up before his dead and spoke to the sons, verse 3 of Heth, saying, I'm a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abe, saying to him, Hear us, Lord, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth, and he spoke with them, saying, if it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and meet with Ephron, son of Zoar, for me that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abe in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered the gate of the city, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field in the cave. He'll say this, by the way, three times, but it's a Bedouin negotiation tactic because Abe doesn't really need a field. He needs somewhere to bury Sarah, and, uh, and, and so he's trying to purchase a cave, but he, the guy he's buying it from says, well, I'll just give you the field and the cave. It's the beginning of the negotiation, but he makes it clear here in the beginning He's not interested in simply selling the cave or giving anything away, actually. And so three times he's going to say it. He says, I'll give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. Verse 12, Abe. Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land. And he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, if you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. He goes, okay, I'll buy the field too. They make it sound a lot nicer. Well, and it might have still been nice, but it wasn't exactly a hostile takeover. But at the same time, there's a lot said that was, well, what's between the lines is actually what was going on. So he says, I'll give you money for the field. Take it from me. I'll bury my dead. He says, you know, answering Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. The land's worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. So rather than saying, okay, the price is 400, he goes, hey, what's 400 shekels between you and me? I think today that'd be about 50 grand. So it might be more than it appears at first listening. So uh, Abraham listened to Ephron and Abe weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, they were a bonus, uh, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as a property for a burying place. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this portion of the story because our focus is going to be on Isaac and on his bride, and we'll be considering that in a moment. But listen, God promised Abraham all of the land of Canaan. The only part he ever possessed an actual deed to would have been a cave there in that field. 
but instead he purchased the cave and the field. He has a deed, a title deed to it already. Now, he never built a city. He never built a house. He didn't try to establish himself in the land. He just walked through it and lived as a nomad in it. He lived as if he were merely passing through. And in reality, that's exactly what he was doing. He kept a very light touch on those things that God had promised to him, but he did know those promises would be fulfilled. And because he waited 25 years for Isaac, and then, well, God requires Isaac of him, now, now he delivers Isaac, and, and so he's looking to the future. By the way, Abe would be buried alongside Sarah in that very same cave. Isaac would be buried there along with Rebecca. Jacob will be buried there along with Leah. And when we get to that story, Leah is the unloved wife, but she ends up in the burial uh, plot in, in a tomb, if you will, that cave with the others. Well, our study begins then with a death, but it ends with a wedding. And again, most of us who are in Christ Jesus, we're going to experience both. We're going to someday breathe our last here. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we will celebrate with him. And I, I touched on this, I believe, on the weekend, either last weekend or the weekend before. It blurs a bit. But that the church is called the bride of Christ. So Jesus is the groom. And the day comes where we die and then we stand before him in glory. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He calls us servants. He calls us sons and daughters. He calls us children of God, but he also calls us the bride of Christ. So we touched on the fact that in those days, marriages were arranged by the families. It was a good setup. And I kind of joked about the fact that you'd get to pick who you'd spend you know, Hanukkah with, although Hanukkah didn't start for very long time after, but who you'd spend every Passover with, who you'd spend Pentecost with. But I was thinking about all that and how sometimes I make light of something that's actually much more serious than that. There's something far more radical about, about an arranged marriage in that sense because you're not just picking the family you'll spend holidays with, you're picking the, the grandparents of your future grandchildren. And, and you're, you're looking toward the future and, and the values you want to impart and the example you want to present. And so, you know, who, who your son married or who your daughter married in those days, exceedingly important. And I would think at least as important today. Now, I'm not saying you can tell, go home and tell your, your teens, hey, good news, we're doing arranged marriages because we checked it out and it's a much better thing. We'll just pick someone for you and we'll let you know when we've got her. And so uh, probably won't go over that well. But, but here's, here's the thing. In this particular passage, Abe chooses the family. He doesn't choose the bride. He just chooses the family from which the bride will come. And God actually chooses the bride. Now, I love that. It's a picture for us. I'm not sure it's a metaphor, but I, I, I know it's a true story, so that's very important. Speaking of metaphors, we were in Rayleigh's the other day, and Pam had told me to pick some stuff up, making enchiladas, and she said, get duck sauce. And I'm thinking, when I'm there, I'm like, duck sauce for enchiladas? I don't know. I don't even love the fish sauce that's in Thai food, and especially if they go heavy on it. So I, the boys are with me, Eli and Lou, they're with us for the week because of vacation Bible school. And, and so I, I said, we got to call, you know, Nana and ask her where the duck sauce is because I, I don't find any duck sauce. And, and so we go and the boys call her up and she says, well, just look with all the rest of the tomato sauce. And I'm like, what? So we go and we look and sure enough, there's a can with a duck on it. It's not duck sauce, it's tomato sauce, it's spicy tomato sauce. And, but the funny part was Eli, who's 11, Lou had just turned 10 
on Monday, the day before. Eli's 11, going to be 12 soon. Uh, when, when I said duck sauce, I just don't see how duck sauce even works. He goes, maybe it's a metaphor for something. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I don't know how that was supposed to help me, but it was fun. It kind of lifted my spirits. And, and so I share it with you for the idea that it might do the same. Well, anyway, Abe was old, well advanced in age, chapter 24, verse 1. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Someday they're going to say that about us. Old, well advanced in years and blessed in all things. So Abe said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord God of heaven and the God of the earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but you will go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. You can see the wheels turning in Abraham. He doesn't want his son marrying one of the Canaanite gals because he knows that the values and the morals and the mindset and the worldview is just a mess. New Testament, by the way, we're told that believers should make sure that you marry in the faith. It wasn't a prejudicial thing. It wasn't a bigoted thing. It was saying, if you're a believer, make sure you marry a believer. It's just a practical thing. Why? Because to to walk with Jesus is to walk a straight and narrow path that few are on. And and, and to marry someone not walking with Jesus, well, they're going a different way. And you might walk real close together for a while, but eventually they're going to have their bent and want to go their direction. And and you are going to need to walk with the Lord. So there will always be that tension. We had it a little bit because I came to Christ before Pam did. Neither of us married a non-Christian. We were non-Christians when we married. But I came to Christ first, and and fortunately, she was actually interested in the things of God. She never bucked going to church. She went with me and listened to the tapes as I, I, I listened over and over to Pastor Chuck's tapes and took notes and was just fanatical about all that. But I came to the Lord, and it was probably six months at least before she came to the Lord. But I have know many other people that, that have done some missionary dating, and they're like, no, listen. He, he actually really, he's a good guy, and he likes God. And, and th- that the question isn't, are you talking about a good guy who likes God, but are you talking about someone who's born again of the Spirit of God, who has the same desire to live and serve the Lord? And if you're engaged right now and this is going to mess you up, uh, let me say that's not my intention. But, but if you're not on the same page as far as your relationship with God, you want to make sure you straighten that out. I'm not saying you shouldn't get married. I'm saying make sure you're both walking with the Lord. And I tell young couples who I clearly, I, we know they're walking with the Lord, make sure that you marry someone who's as on fire or more on fire than you are. Why? Because if, if you're passionate about serving the Lord and they're like, eh, you know, yeah, it's okay. Well, that's going to be a drag on your fruitfulness and your faithfulness because you, you're always going to have that tug again. So anyway, that the idea that he wanted someone from the family, it's perfectly sane, especially considering where he was living and who he was living among. And, and so... The servant says, by the way, the the verse that says we're not to be unequally yoked together isn't specifically talking about marriage. It's talking about everything. Two oxen that are yoked together that are trying to go different directions are going to trash the field and nothing's going to get planted. So anyway, the servant says, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham, verse 6, said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. And and so Abraham, we're going to see, believes in God's providence. He believes that God has a perfect plan for him. And, And he made some miraculous promises to him. And if God doesn't come through, well, there's no way those promises can happen. So, so, 
he, he knows that God has a perfect will for him. But alongside God's providence or God's sovereignty or however we want to define the fact that he is in charge of his universe, there's still man's responsibility. It's like he said he will. God says he will. But then there's the you shall part. So he says, the Lord God of heaven who took me, verse 7, from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying to your descendants, I give this land. Here's the he will. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Gives him an out. But see the, con the, the, the um, beautiful connectedness of God's promise and providence and man's responsibility. He will, and you shall. But he says, if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you'll be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. What's this if she's not willing? Well, Abe knows that God's not going to force the issue. He's not going to make that gal marry his son. But instead, he will woo her and draw her just as he did us. We weren't drafted to become Christians into God's service or into the ministry of walking with him and representing him. He didn't draft us. We signed up. We prayed and gave our life to him. So all of that, and it's important to us tonight, there was clear instruction in what to do if it didn't work out, Abe had faith totally in the promise of God, but he planned in case the servant couldn't do what he sent him to do. The servant had to be faithful, but the bride had to be willing. And I'm reminded that, that this is a little bit of a picture for us because the father sent the son to suffer and die for our sins so we could be reconciled to him. And then he sends the Holy Spirit to woo us to Jesus, to draw us to Jesus. He does it in multiple ways, but he, one thing he had to do was convict us of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come. And when we surrendered and said, okay, I do believe and I want to receive Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit. When we say, Jesus, come into my life, the Holy Spirit comes in and seals us until the day of redemption. So the Father's all about sending the Son to redeem us so we can be in fellowship with the Father. The Holy Spirit's all about bringing us to the Son so we can understand what he's done for us so we can be reconciled to the Father. It always comes back to the Father. So um, as far as verse Verse 9 says it for the second time, so I'll just read it and, you know, comment on it. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Now, my father's generation, they just shook hands. I, I like that better. And uh, now, I guess there's contracts and all that. But either seems preferable to me. I don't get the whole putting your hand under his thigh. But apparently that was, you know, a cultural way of saying, you can count on me or trust me or I'm going to do it. The other thing is it says he swore to him. And Jesus tells us we don't have to swear. So he's like, here, put your hand under my thigh and swear. I'm going, nope, not doing either. I ain't doing that. And I don't need to swear. Why? The Bible says let your yes be yes and your no be no. Whatever is more than these, our Lord says, is sin. Well, the servant took 10 of his master's camels, departed for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Naor. Now, Naor is the brother of Abraham. We read about him at the end of our last study. He had eight children, and then there were grandchildren already. One of those grandchildren is Rebecca. She's the one that's the chosen one. She's the one who's going to be marrying Isaac. So, so uh, he made the camels kneel down, verse 11, outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, oh, Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. His prayer begins, Lord, 
God, not just creator, but Lord, the one to whom we bow, the one in whom we trust, the one we obey, Lord God of my master, Abraham. He was obeying Abraham. And and he's saying, Abraham obeys you, Lord. Well, give me success this day. Show kindness to my master, Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young women to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, the young woman, excuse me, drink and I'll give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. He prays for God's blessing on his mission He acknowledges God's chosen someone specific. He believes, as I do, that there's not just someone for each of us, but there's a perfect one for each of us. Just like Eve was perfect for Adam for multiple reasons, probably the simplest is she was the only girl there was, but but that wasn't the main thing. She was made by you know, made from Adam and for Adam. And I believe wholeheartedly, if you're married and things are going great, or if you're married and things are a little stressed, or you're married and whatever the situation might be, if you're married, that person you're married to is God's choice for you. He wants you to have the best possible relationship. He wants you to bless each other and be, a, be blessed by each other. So I like his prayer. He's saying, God, please, Lord God, bless my mission. And I know you have someone for Isaac. He acknowledges it. And he asks God to reveal the one through very specific words and works. It's a bit of a fleece, but it's not a fleece in unbelief. We'll see that with Gideon. He's kind of afraid and not sure, and, and he... And he He fleeces the Lord, and I've talked about fleeces, and when we get to that story, we'll flesh it out fully. But the problem with fleecing the Lord is if even when he answers, then there's insecurity, and you want to see it again. You want to see something different or more. Fleecing leads to more fleecing. And the, the crazy part of it is God sometimes honors it. He doesn't say, no, I don't like that. I know what you're going to do next. God's just amazing. He just meets us where we are and deals with us right where he finds us. Well, anyway, he's saying, could you you have her say this? When I say this, could you have the one say this and then do this? And listen, God honors that request. He reveals Rebecca to be the one. Why? Because it's that important to him. And he has no problem that this guy wants to be sure he gets the right one. So it happened before he finished speaking. Verse 15. Behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, wife of Naor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now, it's better than it sounds. We're going to see further in. There's something else not said that's just so profound and wonderful. But the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin no man had known her. So she's young, she's very beautiful, she's a virgin and no man had known her. Why would he even say no man had known her if he said she's a virgin? Because he knew there would be people who'd come along and say, wait, the word translated virgin can just mean young maiden. That's absolutely true. The Hebrew word can mean A young maiden. Usually it meant a young unmarried maiden, but it could be used of either. So, two things. When they translate the Hebrew into Greek, hundreds of years before Christ, at least a couple hundreds of years before Christ, they chose a word that could only mean virgin. They realized that people could say as they do, well, how do we know it was really a virgin birth? Because the word can only mean that. And here, in case we don't get it, He just adds something to make sure it's clarified. And and so she was young, she was beautiful, she was a virgin, and no man had known her. 
So she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up, and the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she'd finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Listen, this says something about her. I mean, her character, her, her, you know, her humility. But it also just says she's, she's tough and in shape because, you know, giving a guy a drink, that's one thing. Giving a bunch of camels a drink, those things really drink. And so, uh, you know, they store up. They can go for, for weeks and months without drinking because they store the water. So um, anyway, she says, I'll take care of the camels too. She quickly emptied her pitcher into the trowel, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all his camels. Verse 21 says, And the man wondering at her remained silent so as to know whether the Lord has made his journey prosperous or not. So far, so good. So it was, verse 22, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel, two bracelets for her wrist weighing 10 shekels of gold, and said, whose daughter are you? She had to be shocked. All of a sudden, he's giving her these expensive gifts, and she's like, what, what, what? Because she you know, gave him and the camels some water. No, there's a little more to it. Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Naor. Moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. His prayers are answered perfectly, just what he needed to be absolutely sure and then now she says, yeah, hey, I'm the family. I'm in the family you're, you're looking for someone from. So he begins to worship and praise the Lord. The man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Verse 27 says, he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Listen, his praise is filled with gratitude, with faith, with expectation. But the most important thing said in this particular part is the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. See, that's you know, it's what the world calls a coincidence. It's like when you have a tumor and you go and they do the x-ray and they say, we're going to have to do surgery. And then everyone's praying for you. And, and then you go back in and they do the, you know, preliminary x-rays and, and MRIs before they deal with the tumor and, and the tumor's gone. Does that happen a lot? It happens enough to know that God's still in the miraculous healing business. And, and it's foolish not to ask him first because he doesn't charge anything. And there's no poking you and taking blood from you and all that stuff. But listen, I'm all for doctors. I'm so grateful for them. I, one of my boys had cancer and went through all the treatments and survived it. He's in the sixth year of, of remission. And, and it's like I am so grateful for the medical field, for the technology, for the, the, all that they can do. But we never want to get to the place where we don't, well, there's no reason to ask the Lord because we have the doctors. No, we want to start with the Lord. Then we go to the doctors and we keep praying the whole time. Because when he does such things, it, 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 it's, well, it, those doctors have no answer for it. They're like, well, this just doesn't happen. Or this is so rare for it to happen. Most of us know at least somebody to such things, to whom such things have happened. Anyway, I love his praise. Fill with gratitude, Lord, thank you. Fill with faith. You led me to the house of my master's brethren and fill with expectation because he knows more is to come. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran out to the man by the well. So it came to pass when he saw the nose ring, 
and the bracelets on his sister's wrist. And when he heard the words of his sister's Rebecca saying, this man spoke to me. Then he went to the man and there he stood by the camels at the well and he said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I've prepared the house and a place for the camels. Laban will prove to be one of the most interesting characters we will study in the book of Genesis. And God will use him mightily to mold and shape another guy, Jacob, who will be born, by the way, to Rebecca and Isaac. But he turns out to be a little of a, a, you know, a little bit of a project even for God. God will use Laban to kind of, you know, deal with some of the rough edges. They will be uh, fun to uh, look at and read about and glean from. Anyway, um, the man comes to the house, verse 32, and when he unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him, food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I told about my errand. So he said, speak on. So he said, verse 34, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord's blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. He's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. He explains exactly why he was there and exactly what he was sent to do. And I said to my master, verse 39, perhaps the woman will not follow me. And he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son from my family and my father's house. And you will be clear from this oath when you arrive among my family. If they will not give her to you, you will be released from my oath. I love this though, because we didn't get it in the earlier part of the story. He says, and the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you. He will prosper your way. I love that. And on this day, or this day, uh, I came to the well and said, verse 42, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. It shall come to pass when the virgin comes out to draw water. And I say, please give me a little water from the pitcher to drink. And she says, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Again, it's a fleece, but it's a fleece the Lord is happy to answer. Because it's not in unbelief, it's one of belief. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, those words are profound. He wasn't saying it out loud. That means she couldn't have heard it and responded to it. He simply was praying it from within. Jesus will later say to do this very thing. Pray in your prayer closet that the Lord who hears from heaven will, will uh, you know, reward you openly. You go in the secret place and you pour out your petitions to him and then he blesses you openly but if you pray openly then everybody hears it and then you're never sure if it was the Lord or if they were responding to what you were praying so anyway I, I love this part before I'd finished speaking in my heart there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder she went down to the well and drew water I said to her please let me drink and she made haste and let her pitch her down from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. And I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Naor's son, whom Milka bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrist. And I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who, look at it, 
verse 48, who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, if not tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or the left. Important, it says his brother's son. It's actually the, the or, you know, the, uh, uh, wait, Abraham said, he led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. It's actually the granddaughter. But they do the same thing. They call a son four generations down, the son of Abraham. Isaac's the son of Abraham. Jacob's the son of Abraham. All the children of Israel, sons of Abraham. And, and it's using it like that. But I like that he presses for a decision. He, he's saying, listen, if you're not going to let this happen or help this happen, then I need to know that now so I could just take off this way or that way because he's thinking there's got to be someone else if not her. Laban and Bethuel answered and said, and I love their response as well, the thing comes from the Lord. They too believe this is divine providence, that this is God's sovereign plan from the beginning for, for Isaac's bride. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here's Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. Laban believes the Lord brought Abe's servant and chose Rebecca for Isaac, and he says so. There again, words of faith and words of affirmation and confirmation. The servant here, by the way, and I mentioned this in the introduction, plays the part of the Holy Spirit. He was sent by the Father to testify of his Son, how great the Son is and how much he loves us and, and all that he has planned for us to secure a commitment from us to him. That's exactly what's taking place in this story. All who believe are blessed with abundant gifts in the present, just as she was. This is just the beginning. Well, listen, the greater gifts are reserved for us, stored in heaven for us. Why? Because they will be blessings eternally, forever, and, and not temporally until they wear out or become useless. Verse 52 it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Did you notice how much worship there is in this story? That this guy just worships the Lord left and right. Every good thing that happens, he's worshiping the Lord. And before the good thing, he's praying to him and say, let it happen, Lord, make it happen. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and jewelry of gold and clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. And they arose in the morning and said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. After that, she may go. And he said to them, do not hinder me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so I may go to my master. So they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Chosen, blessed. Listen, she's blessed temporally, but soon she will be royalty. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abe's servant and his men, they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands. And may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. This is a blessing God is going to confirm because he already told Abe, As many as the stars of the heaven or the sand of the sea, so will your descendants be. And those descendants are going to come through Isaac. Then Rebekah and her maids arose. They rode on camels, followed the man, and the servants took Rebekah and departed. I mentioned earlier, we haven't heard about or seen from Isaac since Mount Moriah where the ram was substituted for him. Abe comes down the mountain. They go home. We're reading what transpired after that. 
the death of his wife, the buying of the cave, the sending his servant to find a wife for Isaac. Now verse 62 says, now Isaac came from the way of Beer Laharoi, and he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, for she'd asked the servant, who's this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Soon, either through death or rapture, we are gonna see our Lord. And of course, you know, We pray for the rapture, not because we're afraid to die, but because we all go when the rapture happens. It's not one or two or a few. It's all of us. The trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain caught up together with them, that glorious reunion with those who've preceded us and with him. And then it says, thus we will forever be with our Lord. Wherever he is, whatever he's doing, we will be worshiping him. We will be serving him. So Isaac takes Rebekah. She becomes his wife. He loved her, comforted after his mother's death. Lord, we thank you for this simple story. And yet we see how profound it really is that Abraham, knowing he needed a godly wife for his son, wanted to make sure she came from godly seed, that she came from a godly upbringing. And Lord, we remember there was a time when Abe was, well, like everyone else, without the knowledge of you. Before you reached out to him, he was dead in his trespasses and sin. He was lost like everyone else, but you revealed yourself to him and you called him to you. And Lord, we know you've done that with every believer here tonight. And we pray if there'd be any, Lord, even one person who's never said, Jesus, forgive me my sin. Cleanse me of my sin. Make me your own. I hear about you. I have heard what you've done. You died for our sin. You were buried. You rose again. I hear you promise everlasting life, and I I want that life. And I confess I'm dead in trespasses and sin. And I want to know the plan that you have for me. And listen, if you're in Christ Jesus, the, the, the bottom line is it's, It's not about you. It's about all those over whom you'll have influence. It's about the people who don't know him or those who know of him but haven't given their life to him or those who have and have wandered away from him. Man, put your focus on him and on them. But if you don't know Jesus tonight as the Lord and Savior, you just need to say, Jesus, forgive me and be my Lord and be my Savior. And if you're ready to do that, I'd ask you to raise your hand and to hold it high. If you'll do that, we'll pray together. And the miracle that's changing our lives, and that, that bought our forgiveness and, and changed our direction, gave us eternal life, and now is giving us abundant life in Christ Jesus. That'll begin to happen to you. But you have to say yes to him. If you're unwilling, it's just like Rebecca. She had a choice. She didn't have to go. But she chose yes, and that's what we're asking you to do. Anyone here this evening, right now, need to say yes to the Lord for the very first time? If so, can we pray together? And if so, just raise your hand so I can pray for you. Awesome. I see your hand there in the back. Wonderful. Anyone else want to join this brother before we pray together? Anybody else? You who raised your hand and anyone else who wants to pray along, pray aloud after me. Heavenly Father, 
thank you for loving me, for sending your Holy Spirit to convict me of my sin, to convince me of your love, and to point me to your son. He died for my sin. I've heard it, and I believe it. He was buried and rose again. And I give my life to you because he gave his life for me. I'll live my life for you because he died so I could do just that. And I give you my life now, for now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.